So we're we're sitting just like you are, which simply means we're all in a in a conversation together. So this is not a, a lecture. Um, it's a conversation, and we're exploring something that we deal with every day. So um, that's why we're happy to be speaking on this topic. And essentially, it's a, a topic that I think every every Christian community deals with. Um, really every Christian church. And it's really that way because what we'll be talking about is deeply rooted in the gospel. So um, what we'll be speaking about is the creative tension between, um, I guess you could call it, as we heard this morning, the being and the doing. And so I like to think of it as a tightrope. And on one side you have being and one side you have doing. And you can fall off either side. You can spend all your energy being, and then you're not doing anything but being. Or you can spend your energy doing, and then you get so wrapped up in the doing that you're not being anymore. And there's two passages in scripture that kind of embody these two um, of being and doing. And the, the first is John 17. Now we've already heard that once, but it's very good to hear it again. So Grace will read that. This is Jesus' prayer for unity. John 17, 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. And then from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So there you have, you know, I would say the, the deepest expression of, of being, being in unity. And then the last command that Jesus gave his disciples, go out into all the world, baptize people, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So a very active participation, a very much of a doing thing, and then the other very much of a being. So, so how in the world do you bring those two together um, and try to be faithful to both? And I love the, um, there's actually an old, old Hutterite writing where the, the author went through the, the New Testament and wrote down all the passages that, that seem to be in complete contradiction with each other. And, and there are some, uh, you know, there's a lot of them actually, that appear to be in complete contradiction. Um, and then the, the purpose was to tell the, the reader that only through the Holy Spirit can we understand the truth that is embedded in both of the apparently contradictory passages. Um, a really beautiful way to, to lead us directly to the only way that we can live faithfully um, any part of the gospel is through the, through the Holy Spirit, as we spoke of yesterday, prayer being so important. 
So one response in a community is, is what I would call um, bunker mentality, where you just, you just bunker down and you say the way we're going to maintain our unity is we're going to try to keep out everything that the world um, could throw at us. And so we're not going to, to send our, our children to school beyond the eighth grade. Um, we are going to um, do whatever training our young people need within our communities. They won't go out to university. Um, we won't have our own teachers, you know, um, because of that. Um, so our children will have to be educated uh, somehow within the system. So there's many different ways you can slice that and, and different religious communities have chosen to do that. The other is where you have a, a scattershot type of mission activity where, where everybody is, is doing everything all at once, all at the same time, um, which is obviously very detrimental to being able to form a, a community that has any semblance of, of unity. And so Grace will read, again, it's been, been referred to earlier, uh, Philippians 2, where Paul is talking now about um, the, the unity of, of mind and spirit. So obviously, Paul taking from Jesus that same idea that there is a, a being part of, of being the church. Okay, Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So re really important uh, things that Paul is saying. Um, so he's talking about common sharing in the spirit, tenderness, compassion, making his joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in mind, and then viewing others as more important and their interests more important than ourselves and having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Again, you know, how, how can any of us say, you know, I have the same mindset as Christ? And yet that is what Paul is calling the early church to. And so again, as I alluded to yesterday, um, I, th I think of our um, being in the, in the body together as church, very similar to a, a married couple um, who have made that commitment to each other to be faithful until death. And that relationship takes work. And we know from 30 years experience, uh, there have been times in our married life where, where I was very active um, as an emergency medical technician, um, as someone visiting in, in prisons, um, doing all that type of activity. Um, and, and unless we had some real heart-to-heart, -heart, uh, late night um, discussions would be a charitable way to put it. Uh, you know, they're fairly robust encounters um, late at night until we worked through this relationship between being and doing, because you can destroy a marriage um, by one of the partners doing all the time and not 
spending the time it takes to develop that bond, uh, deepen it, and, um, and foster it, and of course, together in prayer, actually letting God and Jesus into the relationship again and again. So obviously, we started out with only that desire, but it takes a daily coming together in, in prayer and, and you know, talking together, sharing, being vulnerable, saying I'm sorry, asking for forgiveness, um, not resting until we get to that point, and that's where the late night sessions come in. Um, so some of those are after sunset. Uh, and, and yet, because we're committed to it, we, we work at it. And, and as we heard from Kat and Tom yesterday, that community takes work um, and prayer and all those other things. So, so where, do you, where do you find the sweet spot in this spectrum between bunker mentality over here and, and scattershot mission over here? Where, where is that spot in between and how do you find it? Uh, I think, first of all, we have to desire that spot, right? So all of us as disciples of Christ are walking on this tightrope. Um, we want to desire to keep walking and, and, and not give up because, of course, that, that's a, a possibility um, to give up and say, hey, we, we can't do this. And we should never say that when, when Jesus says we should do something, one option for a committed Christian is, is not to say, I can't. Um, it's a bit like your child, you know, you're trying to get them to do something that you know that they obviously can do, and they say, no, I can't. Well, that, that's not an option. I'm, I'm your parent, and you are going to do that. So Jesus is telling us, you know, you are going to be, and you are going to do, because I told you to. And he did say he would send the Holy Spirit to help us figure these things out. So we have to have a desire. We also have to expect that the Holy Spirit will give us the tools, because that's that's gospel. And so Grace is going to tell the little birding story because it really illustrates what we're talking about. So among other things, we, um, we love to go out and, and watch birds. So I have some 670 different species on what birders call a life list. Um, and uh, a couple, uh, probably close to 275 Australian species. So it's just really fun to discover a new bird and Grace will tell of a recent experience we had um, in Darwin in October because it illustrates probably better than any what I'm talking about. Okay, one thing when living with a birder is that it's very difficult to live with a birder who does not see a bird that he very, very badly wants to see. And if you go to, if you're only rarely in a place like Darwin, um, obviously there's birds up there that you can't see down here. So a list was made of the various species that we wanted to see, and over the course of our five-day stay there, we saw most of them, but there were two that were at the top of the list. Uh, one was the red-tailed black cockatoo, and the other was the red-backed fairy wren. Let me just insert it. We didn't bird watch for five days. We were there. At, we were there at a conference uh, inside four walls all day long for four days, and we had just one little window of opportunity. Right. Okay. So we had we had Sunday out, and then we had just one more little time on Monday to try. So Sunday was great. We got about 29 different kingfishers and what have you. They were all beautiful. But we did not spot either of the two um, choice, main choice birds. So on Monday, we had our last chance, and we went to a place where the, our birding friend told us that we could see both of those. So um, we walked through the, the wooded area down to the beach and saw a number of other new ones, but not, neither of those two. And as we started our walk, I just said a little prayer I said, dear God, just please, please, a black cockatoo and a red back fairy wren, please. So anyway, we, we did our walk, and it was getting time to start back. So I was just resigning myself that that was how it was going to be. 
and we were coming back through the woodland area and suddenly both of us were you know looking up the road or whatever off to the left there was this loud very determined chirp and we spun around and there on a palm on a palm leaf big frond in front of us was a pair of red-backed fairy wrens which is a pitch black little wren with a red back they're absolutely gorgeous so that was one so we we did all the looking we could while they were flitting around on the on the leaf then they dropped down and just when they dropped out of sight there was a squawk up in the sky and we looked up and three red-tailed black cockatoos went flying by so i said thank you god and bill said there is a god <laughs> <laughs> so so we got now he has to put this together with what we're talking about. <laughs> We always try to work in a birding story. In the, the, um, so what, what this illustrates beautifully and has to do with our topic is that if, if we hadn't, first of all, looked to see what the possibilities were in Darwin, made up our list, contacted someone who could help us get out into the bush, uh, because this is a budget birding experience. We didn't pay for all the wonderful tours you can do up there. Um, and he told us where we might see these birds, emphasis on might. So if we hadn't have been out in that particular place at that particular time, we could not have been graced by this wonderful experience. Did we put the birds there at that time and place? No, we had absolutely nothing to do with that. So as we walk this tightrope, we have to expect that God will give us the grace to navigate along this tightrope. And when we fall off either side and we do more b being than we should or maybe more doing, um, that there'll be grace there to help us back on the tightrope and, and, and keep going. So it's a matter of, of expectation, of, of belief, you know, Jesus says even if our faith is just as small as a mustard seed, that's quite equivalent to going out in the heat in Darwin and, and going out into this wooded area. Um, you know, you have to step out in faith. But if and when we do, that's a place of blessing. And so as we um, have traveled around Australia these last for in some years, we found a really important place where God can work with his grace is when we're vulnerable. And um, he can only work with broken people. Now, we, we all are broken, but it's one thing to acknowledge that and one thing to say, um, no, I won't. And. Um, that, that brokenness is, is intimately tied to the, um, the way in which we have tried to navigate between these two. So now we'll give, we'll give some concrete examples um, so that this isn't a, a theoretical discussion. Um, so our, our own journey um, involves the fact that, that our son was incarcerated at at one point, and I'd already been doing prison ministry for 25 years and found my, my self in a place where I was visiting not somebody's, somebody else's son, but my own. And um, that, that was a, a place of deep, um, deep brokenness uh, for me. And, um, and I still, you know, as I go into prison now, um, you know, some of that brokenness is relived. Um, and, you know, you can either, you can, you can either shield that, bury it, um, try to build a foundation as if it doesn't exist, or going through that, that valley of, of brokenness and coming out wounded, even though Christ heals the wounds, the wounds are still there, 
recognizing those wounds in others, others recognizing them in you, you then have a place where grace can truly work because it's God's grace that heals wounds. And Nicholas Waltersdorf, um, a theologian in the US, um, wrote a very small, thin little book called Lament for a Son. And in this book, he describes the death of his son at 23 in a mountaineering accident and his own journey through um, his grief. And towards the end of the book, he, he says an amazing thing, which I'd never fully thought of, and that is that um, he demonstrates that Christ's resurrected body bore the marks of his crucifixion. So why in this brand new, beautiful, resurrected body, why, why the wounds? And in fact, it was his wounds that identified him to Thomas, who doubted, he said, place your hand in my wound. They weren't festering wounds, they, they were healed. But they were there, they were visible, they, that's what identified him. And so, so it is with, with us. Um, and, and all of us, all of us carry wounds of some kind or another. You can't live in any kind of relationship with anybody without getting wounded. The question is, will you allow God's grace to heal those wounds through forgiveness and, and mutual love? And again, no different from a child. Um, Jesus said we should be like children. So a child figuratively or literally stumbles and falls. Um, they get up and, and, and keep going. And we, we are to be the same. And so in terms of our, our ministry, the doing part, um, Grace will tell a little bit about her work with Kairos on the outside and how being involved in Inverell from Danthonia, so we were part of this larger community of some 200 people, given the time and space to um, be with other uh, people in, in the small town of Inverell, so traveling there, being with those people, um, and then how that opened doors in Armadale, where we now live, a larger city, um, just as an example of this um, being and doing from a larger community and now in a smaller setting. Yes, I guess the point of this is also just to show that the being and doing um, the building of unity and the going out all happen at the same time and they can happen in any setting. So we, we in our personal experience, um, were most of the time in larger communities, first in the States, then down here. Um, now we're in a small urban community and it goes on in different ways. So the, the connection with Kairos on the outside, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's an organization, it's for women, for um, women who have or have had a loved one in prison. And in Inverell, there was about 20 in the group, and I could join because we had that experience with our son. He is thankfully, and praise God, he's out of prison and he's had a conversion and been baptized. So, you know, now he walks alongside us as a fellow believer. Um, but that is, yes, that is an answer to agonized prayer over several years. And so we have had that experience. So I could join that group and just, just to sit there um, in the circle, what we do is we just go around and each time we meet, we tell how our loved one is doing, how we are doing, you know, the, the, the pains, the joys, and there are, there are some very, very broken situations, but we just encourage each other, and because, you know, I've been through it, I know I can say to one mom, just keep praying, don't stop, you know, it, it will come through, and, um, because in a very real way for us, prayer was the only thing we could do for our son. And um, so that was in Inverell, and then when we moved to 
Armadale. I was introduced by the Inverell ladies to the ones in Armadale, and now um, we have quite an active group there. And there's been spin-offs of that little group, which have opened doors in other places um, with church groups and then encountering people who then come. We have one couple that comes once a week to just sit on our porch and have a coffee and talk, and they are going through extremely difficult times with their son at the moment. And we're able to tell them, you know, one day you will sit where we're sitting and you will be ministering to somebody else. You know, this is the hard season now, but but you will come through. So it's it's beautiful how both things happen at the same time, and you do always have to find the balance. But I think with prayer and with the, lo- the constant longing to reach out, to find fellow believers or others who are searching, who don't, who don't know yet where what their answer, what the answer is, um, both of these things come into a wonderful harmony, actually. And so um, we, we have, now that we live in a small urban setting, um, and for example, over Christmas and New Year's, we went back to Danthonia, the larger Bruderoff community here in Australia. We felt ourselves ministered to um, coming back to that larger, larger community um, where you have this wonderful, as I said earlier, this, this integration of, um, of all the parts of life that in our Western societies especially are so divided. So, so to have a place where, where work is not just a means of making money and making a living, but actually working together is an integral part of, of our being. And, and the, some of the monastic orders um, centuries ago really discovered that, that, that work is a beautiful thing uh, in, in community. And, and it, it builds relationships, and that's where you can truly be your brother's keeper. And that's where the shoulder rubbing happens in the work. You know, if I'm egotistical, that's not going to happen, you know, in the far reaches of some place or other. It's going to happen in relationship to others. It's in relationship to others. That, that we hurt one another, that we need to ask forgiveness, um, that our rough corners are chiseled off, and, and you know, that, that's hard work, but it happens best of all in the actual workplace. So whether that's in, in the in D'Antonia, they have a, a sign shop where they, we make our living uh, making beautiful um, three-dimensional handcrafted signage, or in the laundry or the kitchen or the work with the children, or um, out on the farm. These are places where, where we work together because that's who we are. And, and we say that work is prayer and, and prayer is work. You know, it's all one piece. Same with the education of the children, same with the mission activities. And all these things are a single whole. And if you look more closely or again at John 17, Jesus says it's, it's by your unity that the world will know that I was sent by the Father. So think about that in terms of mission. How do we tell people that, that Jesus is real? Well, I love in the, in the first chapter of John, there, there's two different times where, in the first instance, Jesus and then one of his disciples says, come and see. And, and I love that, and it's embedded actually throughout the Gospel of John, you know, come and see or Jesus says, come to me, um, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. People need to see something, touch and feel this new embodiment of Jesus, which is the church. And so in that unity given by the Spirit, we have a way of saying, come and see. And when the encounter when people encounter that unity, we can tell them there is absolutely nothing special about us as people. Mm-hmm. We're, we're broken, we, we, we hurt each other, um, no different at all. But we can testify that Jesus has changed us individually 
and then through that change and our, our desire, this expectation that, that he will also help us live in unity, something is given to us from God, which by us I'm just meaning our example, it's given to any two or three who are gathered in his name. Jesus says, I will be present with you. There's no exception clauses there. He doesn't say, you know, if, if, if you had to say you're sorry yesterday and, and, you know, you weren't the way you should be, well, I'm not going to be with you tomorrow. He's, he says where two or three are gathered in his name. So in our brokenness, in, in our need of each other and of him, Jesus is present. And, and that's what we hope anybody will feel any time they come across two or three believers together. And that, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. So someone has described the, the church as, as a lantern and Christ as a light in, in the lantern. I love that analogy because it's only when we've been cleansed and purified, and that happens again and again, that the glass in the lantern can be cleaned so the light can actually shine through. Be, you can have a candle in a lantern, and if, there's, if it's so black from soot, there's not going to be a whole lot of light going out of that lantern. The other part of the analogy that I find really beautiful is that uh, there needs to be some structure, some God-given structure in the church, and Paul's letters are, are full of that. So without that structure, you can carry a candle outside, but the first wind that comes along is going to blow it out, and then there's no more light. But, with, but protected by the, the, the structure, the God-given structure of the church community, that, that light can actually remain lit, and then it can shine out into the world. So that, that again, is mission, is that idea of light going out into the darkness. And as it says in John's Gospel, the darkness has never overcome it. So that, that is essentially um, our, our witness. And what I'd like to do is just point you to this first article in, in this edition of the, um, the Plow Quarterly, because I, I read it on the train coming down, and I just I kept saying, yes, this is it, this is it. So this is, um, made a few notes from that. This is Rod Dreher, um, and the title of this article is The Benedict Option and Why We Need It Now. Um, and so he's basically saying that, that really what, what's needed today are, are Christian communities of however you want to describe them. Um, and he says, it's not a matter of running to the hills, bunker style, and await the end. That's ridiculous. Rather, it's a retreat from the mainstream, basically, in order to form the glass around the light so that it can be protected from the gale force winds that are going to blow out the light otherwise. So that's where that um, analogy comes from. And then this is a really great part. Um, he says, life in Christian community um, is evangelical. So we should show the good fruits, which by the grace of God are visible, um, and in that way be evangelical. Then he says, if you're not evangelical in some sense, you're not Christian. And I really love that idea. And he's saying evangelism doesn't only mean <clears throat> going out on the street corners and, and proclaiming Christ. Evangelism also means this being together in a way that Christ can live in us and among us and therefore be visible and that light can go out into the darkness. Um, the, the early Hutterites had a great illustration of that in terms of a beehive. So you have all these bees working together, gathering honey from all over the place. Um, that beehive only has value to humanity as a whole if the, if the pro produce of that activity, the honey, is shared with others. It's no, no benefit to humanity as a whole if the bees are doing that in some bee tree someplace that, that nobody can get to. But in a place where that honey can be harvested, that sweetness, which is a, a gift to all, can be shared. I love that. And then um, 
This, um, then one, one last quote from another article in here, this one by Eberhard Arnold, really interesting setting. So this is 19, in the 1930s, um, Eberhard's nephew, Hermann, a member of the, of the stormtroopers, um, asks if he can come visit the community um, then in, in Liechtenstein. And, and at great risk, his uncle said, yes, you can come. Now just imagine, here's a Nazi stormtrooper actually spending time in your community. What's he gonna do there? Who's he gonna tell about what he sees? Is he a spy? So he comes and visits. He visits. He has a conversion. So Her Herman has a conversion. He publicly renounces his membership in the stormtroop and actually s sends his, his dagger back with, with a letter to his, his captain. Um, and and the, the piece in, in this issue of the plow is actually the, the, the meeting in which Eberhard, Herman's uncle, is, is talking to his nephew about what this is all about. And in that he has this beautiful line where he says, something must be set up, something must be created and formed which no one will be able to pass by. Beautiful, beautiful words. So particularly because we know it, it is not we who, who set this thing up. Um, in, in one of his most important, I think, um, addresses to the small community in Germany on his 50th birthday, Eberhard Arnold um, said, you know, we, we are obstacles. We ourselves are obstacles, and we are hindrances to the work of the Holy Spirit, but we have to witness to the fact that God is at work among us, as broken as we are. And we need our own power to be dismantled so that God can work, and this is the single most important insight into the work of the Holy Spirit, is allowing ourselves to be dismantled so that, that God can work among us. And Really, that is our, our daily experience, both in a larger rural community and also in, in a much smaller urban setting that we're in. So um, Grace is telling me it's time for a little Q&A. Um, and so any of you who have a, a question, go for it. My name's David, um, thank you very much. Uh, primarily for your constant Christological references and references to the spirit, we live in a time where inclusion is the key word in our Western liberal culture, uh, social inclusion, um, and that usually refers to people who don't feel included and people can sometimes manufacture that to get their voice heard. Um, in a Christian church, um, like in any social group, there are limits to inclusion. There is called sociological boundaries of who's in and who's out. That's just a reality of human social experience, whether it be the state, your family, your friends, your sports club, your church. How do you manage, um, I'm a pastor of a local church, right? So people would want to feel included in a church. This is a really inclusive church, let's say. I'm not being autobiographical here, by the way, about my church. Um, but their inclusion extends to radically non-Christological and non moral practices because we want to be inclusive of all. Uh, to me, they've lost their Christology and they've lost the person of Jesus and he's been subsumed under a moral concept rather than the person of Christ. Uh, but how do you respond? Like, that probably wouldn't maybe occur in your community, but in local congregations where there's so many people living so many different lives looking for churches, 
there's so many different backgrounds that does occur. We think of the Corinthian con congregation in the New Testament. So this issue of social inclusion, which is such a high social value, and against what I call Christological moral limits. No, it's, a, it's a really great question. And um, I would say uh, faithfulness to the gospel, to Christ, to the, to the person of Christ, to our understanding of why he came is, is critically important. Uh, I'll never forget the time we, the two of us, were visiting with the house church, um, and uh, this was in in the U.S. And the the reason this house church had formed, they were former um, members of the Friends uh, Quakers, but their Quaker, the local Quaker meeting, could not agree that witchcraft was outside of what should be included in in who's in and who's out. So this particular group of of Quakers had left that meeting and had decided to to form their little house church so kind of a crass example but exactly what you're talking about um, and, and I think only only through a, a desire to be faithful to Christ um, will we navigate that and and a willingness to to be broken with the broken people I mean Christ came to liberate um, you know, so in terms of the moral spectrum, um, my view is that Christ came to liberate every soul. And, and if a soul is struggling with, with different issues, Christ came to, to free us and to liberate. And so that should be the message of the church. That's the light going out into the darkness. And to give this example of witchcraft, my understanding of witchcraft is that that's the epitome of darkness, or one of them. Um, how can how can the church be this frame around the light when when you're accepting that kind of darkness as part of your inclusive message to the world? So we have to constantly be on our knees um, to ask God to give us the understanding of of Christ the Liberator and to let Him shine. Um, through the congregation so that the broken of this world, which includes myself, are drawn to him, to the light. And then, then he, will, he will help us become brothers and sisters across all kinds of, of boundaries and barriers. And, and we've experienced that and can testify to that. Um, and as Grace said, you know, the same is true of our son. Um, so he's he's part of a, a Baptist church, um, and we, we thank God um, for him being there. And we may be thousands of miles apart. We are thousands of miles apart, but we are truly one in spirit and one in purpose, and that uh, gives us tremendous joy. And that same possibility has been offered to us in our own conversions and that same possibility is there for everyone. So that's really the inclusion that I want to focus on it is the inclusion in a converted heart and, and the liberation of Christ. Any other uh, questions? You talked about um, being and doing. I guess another um, spectrum, if you like, is uh, retreat and engagement. Yeah, you know, coming apart and engaging with the world. I'd just be interested to hear how you how you navigate the balance of, of those two along that spectrum and between those extremes. Okay, um, so I would say that's a, that's a daily exercise, um, and part of that daily exercise is prayer. So, so we literally wake up in the morning, we ask God, you know, please bless every encounter today, um, open doors, because we really don't know what you want us to do today. And so in terms of engagement, our first engagement is with God in prayer. Um, 
Secondly, as a, as a small urban community uh, around the breakfast table, we'll begin the day with, with prayer and, and we'll have some type of reading from the, the gospel or some other writing that will help focus us because that's really important that you get up and you have a focus for your day. And then we recognize that when there are, are tensions among us, that we, we can't be focused completely. So we have to deal with those issues, knowing that we can only go out with, with this light if, if the light is actually in the lantern. And so, first of all, the light has to be present among us, corporately as well as individually. Then we ask God to take us through the day and we really don't have much more of a road map than that, um, which is why we're not standing in front of the lectern. We, we're not here to tell you, you know, these are the 10 easy steps to navigating on this tightrope. Um, we're here to have a, a conversation, a really good question. And it's another illustration of that could be um, a wheel where you have the spokes that go out, but they're firmly anchored in the hub in the middle and that hub has to stay firm and strong. If that splinters, then the spokes will fly apart and the whole thing will. So the, the unity, that's where the unity comes in. And it is a constant um, work, struggle, um, to maintain a true unity. And we have the one law that we have in our community is um, it's called the first law of Zanarts because it was created at the beginning. So it's like a, a rule, like the Benedictine yeah. rule. Yeah, and and it's basically, um, and we all promise when we become members to uphold this rule, and that is that we will not gossip about each other or anybody else if we have a problem with something, and that's where the workplace comes in because that's usually where it happens. Um, we will go to the person that created the problem in us and say, you know, I, I really didn't like what you said or I don't understand or it sounds like you're, you know, and the two of them will go at it and they'll talk it through and if, you know, most of the time you come to a, an understanding because we also have the base of humility and knowing that okay, it might have struck us like that, but we might not be right. That might not be the right feeling. You know, so, um, but if, if it's necessary to get help, then they'll call on someone else. So that, you know, this is going on all the time. And then from that unity, that's also then what people feel when they come. They can sense, because it is a very living thing, and it's living in each one of us, wherever we are. Um. I would just say that um, you can see those instructions in, in Matthew chapter 18, which, which this rule, house rule comes from, um, where Jesus instructs his disciples specifically, if, if you have a problem, go direct, bring in someone else, bring in the whole church, and so on. And it's like a building. So a building will, because of the natural elements and so on, it will deteriorate over time. And a, and a building to be strong needs constant maintenance. And it's only as strong as, as its weakest place, where in a hurricane or something, the, the water or wind will batter at that weakest place. So this, this simple house rule is probably the, the most important um, maintenance tool that we have. And it's, again, it's not different from, from a marriage. You let little things by because they're, quote, little, and you add enough little things, and, and that the marriage is, is foundering. And it's the same with the building. You let this little thing go, and that one, oh, that's not so bad. That's just a little crack, and oh, there's another little crack there, but that's okay. The buildings will eventually, without that daily maintenance, the, the building will tumble. And it's the same with, with the church. And we've, we've been in the Broodroof long enough, and, and anyone within any church community will say the same, to have experienced times when, when that maintenance wasn't being done adequately and, and the church community suffered and, and individuals suffered. And that, that's, that's where we hurt each other. 
Um, whereas if you go in love and humility and say, hey, I, I really don't like what you said to person X or, or to me, um, and, and you're willing to be wrong, but the other person is also willing to be corrected, then that daily maintenance can happen, and, and that's the maintenance of the body, which is critically important. So the engagement also um, among each other has to be, has to be living and, and strong as well. Thanks so much, Bill and Grace. Um, my question kind of springs a little bit from our experience, um, and it's around the question of vocation or calling. Um, so if we take for granted that our primary vocation is to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in our community, but also for, for many um, they feel uh, a, another set of um, callings or vocations to engage outside of the community. Um, and and in, our, in our experience, that can kind of sometimes introduce competing uh, demands um, because uh, time is spent away in significant amounts. Um, and if there's too many people that are doing that in the community, um, the, the kind of unity is, is weakened and weakened. Um, but but, how, but in what healthy way can we think about vocation or calling um, where we can allow both, um, uh, yet um, not to the detriment of our kind of primary uh, calling to be the church? Another great question, obviously born out of um, <laughs> personal experience. And, and so I'll just illustrate that with... Um, with prison ministry, okay? So that's obviously a ministry that takes you out. Um, so we came down to Australia some uh, almost five years ago. Um, I have this burden for prison ministry, obviously also built out of my own personal experience. Um, there's a prison about 30, 30 minute drive from, from Danthonia and so that's an example where I don't want to do, do that um, by myself um, because, as you said, that, that takes me away. It's not a decision I can make myself. So what did I do? I, I, brought, it, I brought that question to, to the body of the church community. And I said, you know, I have this burden for, for prison ministry. Um, would it be possible? Can I explore the possibility? Of, of getting involved in this local prison. So the, there was discussion and it was decided that myself and another brother would, would explore that. So it took most of a year to um, figure out how to do it, get signed up with prison fellowship. I'm a prison fellowship volunteer. Um, and to decide that we wouldn't go every week, but there would be a team of four of us and we would alternate and go every second week so there's your balance between going out all the time or, or not at all. So together, discerning where is that spot. So this is a really specific example. Um, where is that spot between um, going out so much to the detriment of the whole or not going out at all, which is, I think, to the detriment of the whole. Um, so the practical decisions were made. And then... Um, we, we became involved, and it's been a beautiful ministry. I just have to tell you a story. Coming down on the train to this conference, uh, someone was sitting next to me, and uh, he, he got a phone call, and, and first response was, praise the Lord, brother, and he went out to take the call between the cars. So he came back. Now, I could have sat there, and said, you know, it's not really my business to do anything about it. Um, but no, now we're talking about engagement, right? So I said, you know, I couldn't help overhearing your exclamation, are you a believer? And he said, absolutely I am. You know, he's got tattoos on every limb possible and so on. And, and so we get talking and it turns out that he was incarcerated in that same prison, um, released three and a half years ago, so just, just maybe six months before I started 
going in there with others who'd been involved for 25 years. So he was in, in there when a prison fellowship volunteered for 25 years, has been going in every Friday. We've joined them. Uh, and and he, he had known, he'd heard about me and I, I'd heard about him. We didn't know what each other looked like at all. You know, so that was a complete surprise to, to meet this man on the train right next to me. And so you can imagine what we did for the next two hours on the train. We did just fantastic. Um, so perfect example. So why was I on the train? I was coming down to this conference. Why, do, why come to a conference? Because we want to engage with, with other believers. So that put us in that place. But it's God's grace that put the two of us together side by side on, on the seat with an aisle between. Um, so just fantastic. So maybe that's a great story to... To end with.